Welcome to TFP, the Theater Folk Podcast, the place to be for drama teachers, drama students, and theater educators everywhere. I'm Lindsay Price, resident playwright for Theater Folk. Hello. I hope you're well. Thanks for listening. This is episode 154, 154, 154, all of the above. You can find any links to this episode in the show notes, which are at theaterfolk.com forward slash episode 154. Today we're staying in house. We have a conversation between myself, hello, and my theater folk partner in crime, Craig Mason. So last year we had the opportunity to travel to Japan and we knew that one of the things we wanted to do was go to the theater. I just, I think it's so fascinating to experience uh, not only theater in another country, but the theater of another country, especially if it's in a language you don't understand. I uh, saw King Lear in Czech in Prague. Um, I was there about 10, 15 years ago. And which is so it's crawl Lear in uh, in Czech. And you really realize how many times the word king is said in the play when that is the only word, you know, and you know that's something that you might miss when you uh, see it in English. And seeing uh, a play in another language is a great opportunity to see how a company visually tells their story, visualizes the theme alongside of the verbal, alongside of the words. A really great adjudicator who I had the opportunity to learn from, Ron Cameron Lewis, uh, he gave us a great uh, percentage that I use all the time in my own adjudications. And that is that when an audience takes in something, it is 60% visual, 30% oral and 10% text. So, you know, if, if, if you're not thinking about that 60% of the visual, um, you're missing out on, on getting some of your audience. And that's a really, you know, great percentage too, if you're presenting to people not in who aren't speaking your language. And, uh, oh, I know another thing I want to say. We're going to Iceland uh, very shortly. And as I was looking up the theater that uh, we could possibly go and see, one of the options is going to see Mamma Mia in Icelandic, which I am fascinated. I'm totally, totally fascinated. So here's a story that I know, music that I know very well, but in a completely foreign language to me. What will that experience be like? I am sure that I will tell you down the road. Uh, Okay, back to Kabuki. Uh, Here's Craig and myself, me and Craig, Craig and I. Uh, We're in Japan, in Tokyo, uh, being even more specific, in the Ginza district of Tokyo, reflecting on our very first time at a Kabuki show. Let's get to it. Hello, Craig. Hello, Lindsay. So when I uh, usually start uh, each podcast, I always say, so where are you in the world to sort of introduce yourself? And I think this is, um, this counts as the farthest away uh, a, a podcast has been has been from don't you think certainly for us certainly for us well it's even better because we're actually in the place i'm not talking to someone from this place we're in the place we are in japan we are in japan uh very cool don't you think i love it (laughs) um it's been a uh and it's really funny because you and i often travel for work uh so people ask you know are you going to japan for work and it's just a vacation yeah that was the funniest question we got when we were going to japan uh, and I don't, I don't know what work we would be doing in Japan. I have no idea. There aren't a lot of English high school theater program conferences in Japan <laughs> that I'm aware of, so I'm not sure w- why would we be coming here for work. But wouldn't that be that? Wouldn't that be funny? Well, and um, so this, what we're talking about today is it's actually theater related, and this, this would be the second question. So the first question is, are you were you going to Japan for work? No, we're going on vacation. And the second one was, what theater are you going to see? Uh, because when we went to uh, England a couple of years ago, we saw a lot of theater. Yes, we saw uh, Shakespeare at Stratford, and we saw we saw all sorts of things. We saw community theater. We saw uh, a real grassroots community show. 
Uh, we saw a touring professional show. So we saw, and we saw Moliere when we went over to Paris. Mm-hmm. So that is a very logical question for people to ask us. What theater are you going to see in Japan? Now, I think it's a bit of a different experience here for a lot of reasons. Yeah, I actually, when we first started planning this trip, theater wasn't really part of what I was thinking of when, when we came here because we both studied. Did you study Japanese theater in school? Not in school. Okay. I did a little bit um, in my theater history courses. And what I learned was that it didn't interest me to see these shows <laughs> uh, because they are just so radically different than uh, what a traditional Western theater show is like. Um, so it was really off my radar that we would see theater here. And for me as a, as a writer, the thing that interests interests me most about... Um, being a writer is observation and it's 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 just been an observation overload my brain explodes every day just walking out the front door of where we're staying in Tokyo and that to me is it's the theater of life I it's a very that's a very that's a very esoteric uh thing to say but it's quite true and I, I I quite love that now having said that it's important to see, um, I think it's really important if you're going to go to a new place, if we are theater practitioners, we should see the theater, even, even because it is so different than anything that we do. Sure. And we have seen a show now. We saw a Kabuki show last night. Mm -hmm. And I am very, very, very glad that I had I have seen it um, because it brought to life what I had learned in history class. And um, it really adds to my understanding of what uh, Eastern theater is all about. So, okay. So like if you're going to, um, if you teach theater history, uh, I, I think a, 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 a unit on Japanese theater might include um, No is one of the forms they have here. Uh, Bunraku, which is a, a, a puppet form. Um, and Kabuki. Uh, so a couple of things about Kabuki. Um, uh, I find it hilarious really isn't the right word I would use, but it's it's interesting that uh, Kabuki was really originated by uh, a woman and uh, women performers. Correct. And, and, and Kabuki is no longer performed by women. It's performed no, by men. Exclusively uh, by men. And women are not allowed to do it anymore. But there's a very good reason for that. Oh, why is that, Craig? Because men. <laughs> men ruin all good things. Yes. Yes. Women women created Kabuki. The ori they originated it. And a guy said, oh, we can't have that. Although, to be, to be, to be fair, the, so this was a government official Government officials said, oh, we can't have women on stage doing that. And then um, the parts were taken over by teenage boys, and the government officials said, oh, we can't have that either. Uh, and now Kabuki is exclusively performed by uh, men. It's a uh, more of a common form, which is a little funny to say when you look at it because it looks very stylized and very ritualistic, but no, the no form is even more of that. Uh, it started around Shakespeare's time, um, which is something that has a little bit in common with Shakespeare, just as students would have difficulty, our students would have difficulty understanding Shakespeare's language. The language used in Kabuki would be hard for a modern Japanese audience to understand. Correct. A lot of the language in the play uh, that we saw last night would also be archaic to a modern audience. Just mm -hmm. Yes. Like you say, Lindsay, just as a modern audience would see Shakespeare, it would be, they, they would, the Japanese audience would have been hearing things that they don't normally hear. I mean, there are some words, we learned very little Japanese for our trip, but there are some words that we did know. And when we were, we had a translating unit. And when we were watching it, the words that we knew were not being spoken. Mm-hmm. Um, the stories that are told are are actually, I think, very Greek related. And I, this is one of the things that I'm going to say, which is why I think it's important to study uh, Japanese theater because of the connections. Um, we want to study the past in theater because it has it really does have such a direct reference to the present, the way that theater is set up and at the rituals of theater and the experience of theater, that all comes from somewhere. And we draw from um, uh, a lot of different influences. And it's really interesting. One of the things I'll say as we segue into our own experience seeing this Kabuki show is it's interesting seeing the influences and the 
um, the commonalities of different forms. Uh, like I, I, I didn't know that in Kabuki, I think that they use a lot of old stories, um, and sometimes they reflect on what's happening in the present um, by using the past, so that uh, you know, again, those government officials don't they don't get ordinary. Yes, well, Kabuki was an offshoot of No, and No is is highly ritualized and highly stylized. And Kabuki was meant to be a more common form, um, something that appeals to the common people, much like Shakespeare's plays were meant to be meant to appeal to the common people. And they would often use Kabuki performances to comment on modern times, to criticize the government. They would never directly be able to criticize things. Um, they would use other stories to make their points and criticisms, but the audience watching would know what the reference was. They would get it. And I think it's also very interesting, too, that in Kabuki, um, there's some direct talking to the audience. It's like, you know, you and me, we're on the same page. We're going to we're going through this experience together, which I think is a another thing with the com with with theater for the common man that theater makes the audience part of the experience as opposed to a presentation form, which I believe no is. Yes, I always, that was my understanding was that it was always very presentational. Um, however, having seen it, there is absolutely no notion at all of a fourth wall, that, mm. that, that mysterious barrier between the performer and the audience that we have in Western theater. It was absolutely not there. There was no no hint of any separation between us and and them in fact l there was one actor who um who played one role at the beginning of the play and then at the towards the end of the play he played a different character and there was even a joke in the play about hey you look a lot like this actor who was here earlier in the play which the audience just loved um but a, 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 like a complete joke completely outside of the world of the play and really emphasize the relationship between the audience and the performers. So let's get into it. Um, okay, so we went to um, a uh, so we went to the show, the uh, Kabukaza. I totally murdered that Kabukaza Theater, um, which uh, opened in 1889, and this theater has a great, great. Um, opportunity, a full Kabuki show is four hours long. Four hours long. And that was, I think, the other reason I, I was reticent about seeing a show, because they are very long. They have... <laughs> they, have they have they have dinner breaks. They have dinner breaks. There's a half hour <laughs> intermission in the middle of the play, and there's restaurants in the theater, and you can go, you can get your food, you can bring food with you, and then there's a break where you can sit and eat your dinner at the seat. Uh, so we weren't really interested in a four-hour show, but this theater has a great thing in that you can go and see a single act. And the way that this... So this was an all-day affair. There was one play in the morning, which was five acts long. Mm -hmm. And then in the evening, there were... Um, and it was an evening of like it was an evening of one act plays. It was three separate stories. Um, so you could, if you wanted to, go in the morning and go see a single act of this five act play, or you could go in the afternoon evening and see one single um, show, uh, which is what we did. We uh, and it was really well organized, which is what I can say about a lot of Japan. It's things are very well organized. Um, you could go and you had to line up. Another thing that is very prevalent in Japan, you had to line up and you bought tickets for a single act and there were a lot of rules. You weren't allowed to go to another floor and you weren't allowed to um, uh, go access to the store. You were there to see the one act of your show, which is fine. And then get out. And then, yes, get out. You weren't allowed to stay. And we we, uh, uh, we were at the very top of this, uh, of this theater, a beautiful theater, um, and uh, but very intimate too. I found this. We went to a sumo show, and uh, I f we were at the very top, and it was very intimate sumo and show, sumo competition. And Lindsay took a picture of the theater just before the show started, so we'll include that in the show notes for this mm -hmm. episode. Okay, so we also had a, uh, which was a great uh, buy. We also had these little, they gave out, not gave out, you could uh, purchase little rent, little boxes. And they gave, it was a translator, and they provided um, uh, 
comments and uh, a text of, of so the songs that they sung and the, um, the dialogue. And I found that uh, incredibly helpful to connecting to what was happening on stage. And what was lovely about the translator and the performance in general was that there actually is very little spoken dialogue or sung words. So you you weren't sitting there reading the whole time like mm -hmm. you do at an opera. You could really just read your the two little lines and that would cover a minute of, of a oh, song. Sometimes five minutes. Yeah. Uh, it, particularly if there was a dance. Okay, so we saw a show, and it was uh, uh, Janaya G. Um, and this is a very rarely performed show, which was really neat to see. And um, so and the other thing that happens in Kabuki is you don't actually see the whole story. So, for example, so in this story, it's about the spirit of a girl who died from a broken heart and um, enters the body of the fool of a fool, uh, Sukitaro and rages for jealousy and Janayaki is a willow tree at the foot of Mount Koya uh, which was a snake and the snake was um, changed into the tree with the power of Buddhism and it's the grudge of women who were abandoned by her lover as the background of this work uh, because women were not allowed to enter the temple at Mount Koya. I'm gonna say we didn't see a lot of that background. <laughs> yes, I'm glad we read that beforehand because almost none of that was actually in the play. No. We really just met the 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 fool who was possessed. What what we saw was that there were supernatural things happening around the willow and the priests call on the high priest to come and deal with it and they go to the willow and the willow is sort of um it 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 possessed the snake possessed the guy, and then the willow changed back into a snake, and the whole, the, at least half of the play was the fight between the snake and the monks, and then at the end there was a, a deix, deix machina where a, a guy came in and they and saved the day. Yes, a god came in and, yes. and saved everything. That That's the entirety of, of what we saw over the course of an hour. Of an hour. <laughs> Uh, the really neat thing about this theater was that it was rectangular in shape, and un but unlike our theaters, where typically the narrower part of the rectangle is the stage, it, it is where the stage is. It was the the stage was the length of the theater, so mm -hmm. the theater was very very wide, um, which got us fairly close to the action, even though we were in the cheap seats. And everything happened on stage. So all the musicians, there were two rows of musicians. Would you say there were 20 musicians? I counted 20 musicians. And then in addition to the musicians that we saw on stage, there was um, an offstage uh, big drum that is in a special little box. And then halfway through the play, there was another percussionist who came out on the side who had, I believe, like a bamboo mat that he smacked. Mm -hmm. The music, which is, again, it's sort of foreign to our ear because they sing in quarter tones. Is that what makes I'm it? not sure, but it sounded like quarter tones to me. It's it's a very odd. To, it's odd to our ear. You can't get, you know, as a as a Westerner, I'm, as a, just responding. It's it's very odd. I found I will say, though, having read reading the lyrics, I found the lyrics very beautiful and very, uh, it's very poetic. And, um, you know, I remember very, one very specifically talking about, um, you know, the turning, you know, the whole notion of, of our life as a wheel and the wheel turns and the wheel turns as our, as we're, as our faith ever turns, you know, you know, sort of being that, that struggle of, uh, of keeping your faith. I thought that was a beautiful image. And I think if you're at all familiar with um, haiku poetry, Japanese mm -hmm. poetry, you would be very familiar with the type of language that's used in uh, in kabuki theater. Again, s around the same time as Shakespeare, so everything's very uh, very poetic. Mm -hmm. And I will say that musically, the drumming was just fantastic i just felt i felt m on more i thought that i would be very removed again i thought i would be very removed from seeing this show because of what i know of of what i know of no and that it's very presentational and i wasn't i was a uh, many many times i was really drawn into what was happening um and the drumming i think has a lot to do had a lot to do with that it was very um i don't know if drumming is common but it certainly engaged me 
um, a lot. Uh, so, uh, so everything's on stage. The musicians are all on stage. They stay there for the whole time. Um, if anything is going to, if any props are going to move or any set pieces are going to move, they are all done by, um, by by stagehands who are on stage the whole entire time. Yes, they have a special name, and I, that name escapes me right now, but they wear, instead of costumes, they wear these brown um, smocks, I yes. guess you would um, equate them to. I think they wear black in no, but they move, anything that moves on and off, they're responsible for that. They also... Interestingly enough, they do not walk on their feet. They walk on their knees, and they walk as quickly and effortlessly as you walk on your feet. See, I think they were walking on their feet, but they were in a squat. Oh, it was a squat. Uh, yeah, I was. I was wondering that myself. It was. It was insane to watch. There was a couple of times where all I did was watch the <laughs> watch the people because watch the the them move off and on and and all of the the, the all this the, the mechanics of the stage happening and um it's just so again all of that was so effortless and so um uh oh, beautiful it had a real flow to it you know there was one point where the, the when the snake when the when the guy who was possessed he was being turned into a snake parts of his costume had to come off and a fan was fl flung into the air behind him. The guy who was the stagehand just basically picked it out of the air. And I also noticed when the, so then the snake became this monster and, and, and the costume was not, um, uh, it wasn't representational of a snake. Um, well, more than actually, I think it was, which I'll talk about in a second. I think it was, it was, it had very long, long pants um, which, 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 which to me represented the snake's tongue and, uh, but they were very hard to walk in. And anytime the actor made a movement, there was the guy behind him fixing the pants, fixing the pants, making sure they weren't like, and he also was there giving the guy a little stool. I noticed that the, there, there were these four monks on stage who had to sit there, I think for about 20 minutes and they got Kneeling. little, they got little, well, they got little stools. The guys oh, did they? Were, yes. oh, I didn't notice that. Uh, so that I think that's a good entree to the precision of oh. the performance, and 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 this again is something that's very different, I think, from uh, Western theater. Is that if we were to go see this show today again, we would see an exact copy, um, moment for moment, of the show we saw yesterday, and right like right down to positions of fingers and mm. hands shapes of elbows and knees and movements and steps you know if somebody took 20 steps to cross the stage last night they will take 20 steps to cross the stage tonight because they rehearse for months and months in fact they rehearse for their entire lives for these types of roles uh so everything is carefully calculated there is nothing that is left to you know interpretation in the moment you know when we're in when we're doing a play in the Western theater, sometimes an actor will get inspired to try doing something a little bit differently one night. Um, that does not happen in uh, No or Kabuki. It is, uh, it's regimented. It, it is, and it's, um, so, and that's something that is prized. Mm -hmm. However, I didn't feel that, that that took away from my enjoyment of the show. And I thought it, I thought it would. I thought that, I thought that everything was so exact would, uh, would bother me. I don't know if bother me is the right word, but, but would, would take me out of what I love about theater. And it didn't. I was still very engaged in, in what was going on. I agree. Uh, it was very, I felt they were, I didn't feel anybody was phoning it in. Um, I think that would be... I think it would be impossible to phone it in. I think it would be, too. It's so... The cost... Everything is so... Um, I think that we're... I mean, one of the things is that a lot of the costuming is... I'm sure it's very heavy, and it's very uh, extravagant, and in many layers, and we're supposed to be... You know, we're supposed to admire how effortlessly and... and, and um, uh, they move in because they, there's a lot of dance that's involved in kabuki as well. It was very interesting to watch them move. Um, there's a lot of gliding that goes on. It's a very different walk that they have. And there were lots of moments where the, the actors were completely still and everything that was happening was through the, um, 
just vocally, vocally, it was there the, when they were all talking about how their 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 temple is being um, threatened by this monster, and it, it, there there is that there was a lot of um, emotion in, um, but but very precise emotion. It was mm-hmm. a it was a very precise sort of vocal tone uh, that was going on uh, when the go- when there was a guy who was possessed. Even if we didn't have the translator, it would be, would have been easy to know that he was possessed because he had that ghost, ghost voice. Yeah, the ghost voice, yes. Um, and that was very interesting as well, that, um, that there was that stillness uh, and yet very vocal quality and then also the dance. And a lot of the dance had to do with, um, it was very interesting to you to watch the dance because it was very low uh and very st- a lot of stomping a lot of stomping going on and that gave the whatever was the the stage was made of there was an echo that was just boom throughout the theater yes when i was researching what we were going to talk about today i, I saw a thing that that basically described western dance as attempting to defy gravity and mm. this style of dance um is very earthbound so there was a lot it had a lot to do with stomping almost like a very very loud tap mm-hmm. dance yes well it's and it's very it's a it's a um it's just booming uh and uh, so the, another thing that was in just in terms of movement which was fascinating to see again we did not need to know uh anything about it was the representation of the snake there isn't a lot of set in kabuki theater um there is the the backdrop is very important uh, this particular backdrop took its cue from uh no there's often a pine tree um, that is the backdrop in no theater, and this one had one of those. Um, there was a place to exit on either side, uh, and the costumes. It was based. The costumes were beautiful, and then when the 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 snake um, became the monster, uh, would you say there were like thirty guys who came on? Yes, I would say somewhere around there were there were something around forty performers, and I think thirty of them were the snake. And the snake was just affected by um, them holding fans in very precise positions, and it was a stunning, beautiful representation of a snake. Yeah, they were the scales. Like you could tell that they were the scales. And at some points, it was a very abstract. Like it was sort of like it was the tree that they were they were the branches of the tree but then at one point um the 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 monster moved across the stage and all of the actors um who were part of the stage they moved across the stage and and the fans moved and then it actually he they became the snake all the way to the you know how rattler rattlers have that thing at the end um of their tail and one of the actors went up in a uh, in a shoulder stand and like fluffed his feet over and it it became this massive snake and so like no um n- you know no modern special effects no modern technology um just uh some actors and some movement and a very simple prop became theatrical mm-hmm. they did have some interesting technology in the theater even yes. though it was very low tech there was a massive a uh, trap that dropped um, at one point in the show, and then, and then um, there was a scene change, and the whole scene, the whole next scene appeared up the trap, which is actually there was no scenery; it was all no. it was all performers that came up. Yes, right. which made me wonder. I, I I was I was because at one point during a song, the trap dropped, mm-hmm. and then the trap stayed dropped for about five minutes, and then the actors all came back on through the through the trap and it just makes me wonder for such a traditional form because obviously hundreds of years ago there was no trap well there could there have, may been. have been you know what i take that back because certainly shakespeare had a trap that would have been made it wow gosh can you imagine if that was just a hand rolled that would be a pretty spectacular entrance just made me wonder the choice of that i uh, no, i did read that they they continually evolve <gasps> really i know that the cha- things change mm-hmm. okay it's a good thing it is a good thing. Okay, so what did we learn? Um, we learned that it's uh, it's really important to uh, have these experiences and to see see theater that is uncomfortable. 
I think that's the, half the reason why we didn't want to go see it. We didn't want to go sit through a four-hour theater show. Wah, wah, wah. Um, and to... And also, I and the other thing is that I, you know, I've, I've done a little bit of research on No, and the little bit I've seen, it just it just looked dreadful in ter- from my perspective, and that's what I was expecting. And um, just to say, like this is something that you're going to come across if you do a unit like this in um, with your students. That's going to be their first response. It's not normal to us. Um, the sound it sounds weird to us. They're not acting the way we act. It might be boring and all of those things while they're true responses it's important to see theater that's not um, that's not that's not our norm and to reflect on it and how where does it come from and why do they do these things this way and what is ritual and what can we and what can we get from it Absolutely. I think it was very important to see something that was so different than than what we're used to. And not not weird, just different. Yeah. Just, just a different way of expressing uh, and telling a story communally. And that's all we're really doing in the theater is we're just all getting together and sharing a story. And it was just fascinating to me to see a completely hmm. different way of doing that. We get so set in our ways, we get so used to what we're used to that it's hard to imagine that there's any other way of telling a story other than the way we do it um, in our theater. And I would challenge, so what I would say to you is I would challenge you, the listener, hello, hi, how are you? I would challenge you to to express that to your students. How can we tell a story differently? How can we take a story that everybody knows? um, You know, what is a story that everybody is very familiar with? And how can we tell this story in the Kabuki style with, um, uh, with uh, some portions that are purely vocal and very still? How can we tell a story through dance? How can we tell a story in which um, a, the, the one part of our story. So in this, in this particular story, a, uh, jealousy is, and, uh, for having a broken heart is manifested into a huge snake. So how do we take something like jealousy, which everybody is very familiar with and turn it into an abstract concept that is expressed by your entire class? Um, how do we show things through costume and makeup and how do we tell a story um, in a completely foreign way as an experiment it might work um, and it might not and that is I think important absolutely this has been a it was just a, it was a really worth what a worthwhile experience and I was um, moved it actually really made me want to be I wanted to be the snake and, and par- oh, not <laughs> not the snake not the guy who was the snake but uh, there was the, the there, fans I one wanted to fans. be one of the fans and I, I've always had a um, my high school did, never did musicals and uh, so I have very limited experience with musicals and I love musicals and I've always wanted to be in the chorus of a musical that's like it's a ridiculous thing to say, but that is on my bucket list to be in, in the course in the of, course of a musical. And when I was watching the Kabuki and I was watching that, that's I was like, there's there's a thing that is completely impossible to have in a bucket list to be in a Kabuki play. I just I just thought it was um, a one time thing and a remarkable thing. I just thought the whole experience was lovely. And just before we go, I want to take a, just a very quick detour. I know Please we're do. long, but I just want to take a quick detour to something else we did, which uh, really does tie into this, I yes. think, was that we attended a, a sumo tournament. Um, and I was expecting, you know, just big, well, I'll use the F word, fat men uh, yeah. throwing each other around. And it was so much more than that. And we had the privilege of coming to the match earlier in the day where we were able to sit in a much better seat than what we had paid for and and watch some bouts up close. And uh, I will also include video of this in the show notes of the, the absolute ritual around the bout. Uh, a sumo match ha- is about 80% ritual and 20% fight. 
It begins with a song that is sung. It begins with a ritualistic uh, uh, brushing of the ring with a broom. It begins with the uh, ritualistic entrance of the performers who bow and go through a series of, well, more or less dance moves uh, before they begin their match. Um, in the later matches, the more professional matches, there is even much more ceremony and pomp and posturing but the video i have for you is just a very much a pure beginning to end of a match showing how it uh yes the ritual of before the match and then the, again there's a ritual after the match where the loser bows and then leaves the winner stays and and squats while the referee awards him the victory um and i believe no, it doesn't end with a song. It begins with a song, though. So uh, anyway, th th it, that, again, was just a completely ritualized uh, version of of sport and ties very well in with, I think, what we saw. The ritual. Well, it's all about ritual, isn't it? And, uh, you know, and, and, and that is something we have never lost. We have never lost ritual. We have much different rituals now in our in our modern life. But to say that things like kabuki and to say that things like uh, sumo are distant from us um, is to neglect the fact that just as they have very um, rituals which are heightened, we all have rituals in our life. And that's something that would be a very interesting thing. When you start to talk about the um, the origins of theater, it all begins with ritual, doesn't yes, it? Yes, it certainly does. It starts, yeah, yeah, of course it does, yeah. And that's where it starts with ritual and then, you know, and then an audience is brought in and then a second actor is brought in in, in the Greek world and then a third actor and then the, and then we, you know, bring in different spaces where theater is performed. And to be an actor and to have a concept of theater is to understand the the concept of ritual. And at and and, and from my personal perspective, the sumo was was again, it was another thing that I had a preconceived notion about uh that it would be something that I wasn't going to be interested in. And we were there for hours. And it's the same thing over and over. It really is. It's, it's a ritual is we go in, we do this, we uh, slap our legs a couple of times, we lift our legs a couple of times. And in the, in the later rounds, we throw salt and we're like very posturing and we're like, um, it's a, it's a very much a uh, moving back and forth between the two fighters. I'm going to beat you. You're going to beat me. I'm going to beat you. And then, and then the fight. And it was, um, astonishing. I, I loved it. So this. So this. So we are. Uh, we again. We are. <laughs> we are. We are speaking to you from all the way on the other side of the world, and it has been a fantastic experience. And we're going to put a lot of this stuff in the show notes, and um, and I hope that uh, I hope this has been an interesting peek um, peek from the other side of the world. Sayonara. Sayonara. Oh, thank you, Craig. We have the best conversations. I love it. Okay. So, uh, before we go, let's do some theater folk news. I mentioned King Lear at the beginning. Kral Lear. And, uh, oh, did they chew on that word Kral? Oh, my goodness. Uh, so, this is a good time to bring up our Shakespeare in an Hour adaptations. Uh, these are cuttings of the original text, the original Shakespeare. But more than that, these are all annotated. So, there's going to be character questions. There's going to be vocabulary words. There's going to be points of discussion. Shakespeare is meant to be performed. And that means we need a doorway to understanding for students. We need to get students on their feet and comfortable on their feet performing Shakespeare. So use these versions in your classroom, in production. Make that guy, make the bard come to life. You can find our Shakespeare in an Hour on our website, theaterfolk.com, or through the link in the show notes at theaterfolk.com forward slash episode one. Five, four. Finally, where oh where can you find this podcast? We post new episodes every second Tuesday at theaterfolk.com and on our Facebook page and Twitter. You can find us on youtube.com slash theaterfolk and on the Stitcher app. You can subscribe to TFP on iTunes. All you have to do is search for the word theaterfolk. And that's where we're going to end. Take care, my friends. Take care. <laughs>